Okay, I'll speak up. So, thank you for the introduction. Uh, together with Art Olson, uh, we're the TSRI out outpost of NBCR across the street. And uh, our contribution to or participation in, uh, in NBCR is uh, to provide a visualization environment. And we take the word visualization in a, in a broad sense. It can be data or simulations or workflows that capture certain processes. So the, the goal of our uh, NBCR core is to provide visual tools that will facilitate the development of applications in biomedical research. And this is done in a setting uh, of multi-scale, multi-physics models. And before I get to this, I'd like to just step back and talk a little bit about what we do in our labs and what has been leading us to develop some, some of the software that you have seen during uh, the, the Summer Institute. So we're interested in receptor uh, ligand docking. And uh, some of you who take the virtual screening uh, track have been uh, introduced to Autodoc, which is very well known that, that we see here, uh, as well as Vina, which is a new uh, docking software that has been developed. Uh, both these software are developed in Arts Lab. In my lab, we have been working on a software called FlipDoc, um, and since it has not been uh, introduced during the Summer Institute, I'll just give you a, a quick rundown. The idea, FlipDoc stands for uh, docking, uh, a flexible ligand protein docking. And the, it uses the autodoc force field, but it tries to add flexibility in the receptor. And the way we do that is by using a hierarchical uh, multi-resolution scheme, where the idea is to say we start with a, with a protein, and we're going to start breaking it down into pieces that we consider being rigid body rigid bodies at some level of approximation. So you can start, for instance, with HIV protease, which is a dimer. You can um, partition it into two chains and assign a hinge motion to one of the chains. So basically, the partition guides the type of motion that you want to encode in your model. So down here, we have an example of uh, a hinge motion for a protein kinase. So we have a hinge axis. And actually, this is not really a hinge motion. It's a hinge combined with a small random perturbation. But basically, it encodes some kind of conformational change. Then we can go down the tree and decide that every chain is actually made of a core region and a flap region. So we can partition our model and then associate maybe some normal mode motion to each one of the cores and decide to add a, a hinge to, this, to describe the motion of the flaps. And, this, and, and we, can go, we can go on like this and decide to partition the core into most of the core, but split out two side chains because we want to use rotomeric side chains for, for, this, uh, um, for, for the, representing the flexibility of these side chains. And all these, um, all these motions are going to be combined. Uh, they, they, they are convolved, and they describe uh, a small subspace of the conformational space accessible to the protein. Um, any one of these, so, so basically you encode your conformational subspace and you have a few variables like a hinge angle, uh, the normal mode that you want to use and its amplitude. Here, one, one uh, hinge angle for every one of these hinges and a rotomer index. So a few numbers and these are the variables that you want to optimize during your docking experiment. So you can add a, a ligand, and we have a ligand in green here, and basically we're going to use GA to optimize these variables using this, uh, the autodoc scoring function. So here we have a docking experiment where the receptor actually feels the ligand during the optim optimization. Uh, besides um, uh, ligand uh, receptor docking, we're also interested in protein-protein uh, docking, and we're working on a tool called F2Doc which is a fast Fourier method for protein docking. Uh, the idea is that we take a, 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 receptor, a, a, a receptor protein and a ligand protein, and we define a zone around the molecule called the skin. And inside the molecule, we define the core. And we're going to try to optimize or maximize the overlap of the skins and penalize for overlaps or, of skins and core or core and core. And here we see some, of, some results for um, the barnes barnsar complex, where basically we're just uh, cycling through a bunch of uh, solutions that have been found. Uh, and this calculation was done in, uh, using purely shape complementarity. Um, besides docking, we are interested in visualization of, uh, visualization of all types, but in particular large ma macromolecular assemblies, such as viruses that we see here. Uh, and the people who are in my track on workflow have become intimate on how to build 
workflows to, to build this, uh, these models. Um, Art, a few years back, built this model of uh, blood serum. And at the time, this was mainly for uh, visualization purposes. But this is a, a real, uh, real three-dimensional model where the, you know, the, the, the objects are placed to not overlap and with the proper uh, uh, densities. And we're collaborating with Arian Elcock, uh, who is a former student of uh, Andy McCammon, and has these uh, Brownian dynamic simulations for uh, very large systems. So this is another area in which uh, we're trying to be active. And then a, a few years back, uh, Art uh, pioneered the use of 3D printers to actually take the models that we build in the computer and take them out of the computer and put, it, put them back in your hands uh, using these tangible models. So most of the things, anything that you can build in PMV uh, that is a closed surface, you can actually send to this printer that's going to uh, re result in a, in a physical model. And these models have been very popular with uh, collabor collaborators. They are very happy to finally hold the molecule they've been studying so for so long in their hands and show to their collaborators, you see, this is where this happens. And uh, so it's, it's a very effective uh, communication tool. And Art has been uh, producing a, a number of very uh, beautiful and amazing uh, models over the past few years. But once you print a model, you pretty much made all the decisions about what the model is going to look like and how you decide to represent your molecule. And you lose the flexibility that you had in the computer that by the click of a mouse, you can change the representation, you can change your coloring scheme, you can have a ribbon diagram rather than a molecular surface. So there is some, some loss of flexibility there. So we started looking into augmented reality where the idea is that you take a camera and uh, you basically, uh, point the camera at the physical object that you're manipulating and then on the screen you see the video feed but we put some tra some fiducials on the model that allow us to track the object in the scene and then we can compute some properties and on the screen display additional information so for instance here uh, someone is holding I think maybe art uh, is holding uh, uh, mo two models of uh, superoxydismutase and the computer superimposes the uh, volume rendering of the electrostatic field around the molecule. Uh, here I have a, a little uh, video that shows you what this looks like but for some reason it doesn't play in uh, PowerPoint so I need to play it outside. Um, so this is our the rig with the little camera at the top and here Alex Gillet is holding a stick and ball model but on the screen I, you can barely see it but here again we have the same stick and ball model and the computer computes this molecular surface uh, and superimposes it and here are the fiducials that are used to track the transformation in the scene. In the next example here, it's difficult to see, but there is a, a virtual backbone here where we, we have a, a physical model of backbone and there are little pegs that have the fiducials and the side chains are virtual. They are generated by the computer. Uh, but uh, by, by rotating the peg, you are actually rotating the side chains. So you have a way to, you could imagine that you compute interaction energies. Here we have a a uh, model of uh, HIV protease that's you know a physical model that you're holding and the ligands that are that were cycling through the the inhibitors here are virtual they are added by the computer so and here this is SOD with little marching ends uh, along the gradient of the the electrostatic field so it doesn't oh I have to kill this guy So the reason I told you about all this is because this is what has prompted us to look at how we write software in the first place. We have this complex problem represented by this molecular assembly here, and we have a number of computational methods that we want to bring to bear in order to address this problem. But these methods have very often been, been written independently of each other, and they're not really meant to cooperate or interoperate. So in order to get these things to work together, in order to solve a problem, we have used an approach which is based on uh, software components. So the idea, we use Python as an integra integration environment, and within Python we develop a bunch of components, software components. For instance, we have a component for 3D visualization. 
So this only does handles polygons and 3D labels and knows about cameras and lights and clipping planes. We have a component that handles molecules, compute surfaces, compute electrostatic potentials, and you can add components to do anything. What's very important is that any of these components is written completely independently of the other components. This is where you get your code reuse. Most applications that you use, uh, and I'm not going to cite names, but molecular visualization application, usually the viewer knows it's, view, it's rendering molecules. And as soon as you're not rendering a molecule, you have to bend over backwards, or usually you have to make the viewer believe that the object you're rendering is a molecule. So, uh, and that leads to, I mean, it's, it's not very efficient. So using this application, uh, these uh, components, we have developed software over the years and PMV, which some of you have seen if you are in the virtual screening or in the workflow uh, track. Um, is a, it's just a molecular viewer, just like Chimera or VMD or PyMol. And the, the main difference really is that it's built from independent components that have been reused in, in, uh, in other applications. So from an architectural point of view, PMV needs a Python interpreter to run, and it uses the viewer framework, which is a boilerplate visualization application. Viewer framework uses the deja vu component, which is our 3D OpenGL-based 3D viewer. Uh, nested boxes here uh, denote um, dependencies. So in other words, you need a deja vu to be present for the viewer framework to to work properly. So that gives you a boilerplate 3D visualization application with support for writing your menus, your graphical user interface for setting your parameters. All this, it does automatic logging of the commands that you do. Uh, and then we add our molecular stuff by writing commands for PMV in this framework. PMV has been specialized to become a, a graphical user interface for the program Autodoc. Uh, by adding a bunch of commands that are completely specific to Autodoc. Um, so these commands allow you to prepare your data for a docking calculation, submit the calculation, and analyze the, res uh, the results. Because they have been developed within the PMV framework, um, the developer of these commands don't really have to worry too much about how to draw a molecule, how to read a PDB file, because all this is provided by PMV on top. And everything that you do in PMV, computing surfaces, all this becomes automatically available uh, to, the, uh, to the Autodoc layer. Another example of reuse is in uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew McCulloch's lab. They, um, they work with uh, heart mesh models. So they basically reused our boilerplate application for visualization. And instead of having molecular stuff here, they have their heart meshes. And so they, they generate this application that is quite different from our application, but reusing many of the components. Uh, so this for us was a, a small victory because it showed that our components were indeed reusable outside the context of our own work. And actually this is a very good exercise because even though I was claiming clean separation between components, uh, you always have little dependencies that creep in that you don't realize until somebody takes your viewer framework and say, hey, why does it import MOLKit? Um, and that obviously is a mistake. So as a consequence, uh, for we have added to our regression test the fact that we test that no dependency that not declared doesn't appear. So overnight, overnight our software runs a bunch of tests and every component declares, I know Deja vu knows I need numeric OpenGL and TK inter, and it has a list of the dependencies that are okay. And uh, when we can actually find out everything that is pulled in when we run the test, and if something gets pulled in that shouldn't be there, it raises an exception and the test fail, and the next day we have to look at that. So another program, uh, problem that we have, or not problem, but challenge we've been looking at is to how do we empower users? And I think this relates somewhat to what John was saying, which is, you know, there are many computational resources and computers become more and more powerful, but it seems that in order to use the power of the computer, you have to become a computer scientist. If you have an application that doesn't do exactly what you want, you can learn to program to change the application if the source code is available, or else you have to beg with the, the guy who wrote the program to, to get him to implement the feature. So 
we've been looking at, at ways to empower users to extend applications without having necessarily to learn programming languages and syntax and, and become a computer scientist. So the idea is visual programming. And the basic idea is that you have libraries of these computational nodes that perform a, a certain task. And you have a, an area here called the canvas, the programming canvas. And you can drag and drop a node from the library onto the canvas. Uh, so here I drag a read image and a show image node. Uh, po output ports are at the bottom, input ports are at the top. You can create connections between output ports and input ports and then specify the image you want to read and the image is read, sent down to the show image that's going to display the image. So we just wrote a little program which is an image browser um, that's actually quite powerful because this thing understands practically any image format, TIFF, PNG, JPEG, whatever. Uh, and yet, we didn't have to worry about uh, programming syntax or about data structures. I don't have to worry how do you read a JPEG image and how do you st store the data in memory. Um, so we were, because the tools that we write are used by uh, computational biologists or, or biologists, more biologists than computational. Uh, and they do not necessarily want to learn a new programming language. We happen to work in Python, which I believe is so much nicer than, or easier than C++, but still it has its own little things, you know. You have to understand the difference between a curly braces and a square bracket, and biologists don't really care about these problems. So here is uh, our tool Vision, which is our implementation of a visual programming environment. And uh, you can build this, uh, these computational networks. We support the concept of a macro node, which is a node in a parent network that actually encapsulates a complete subnetwork. So this is really a hypergraph where every node can be a subgraph. And these macros can be nested indefinitely. So you can, this is nice because it allows you to build networks where you can still, you, you have a hierarchical view of what's happening. You have the high level view where you have blocks that might do pretty substantial work and then you can drill down into one of the blocks and see what is the implementation. How does, how does that really work? And that's also good for, uh, good for code reuse. If you have one little network that does something useful, you might want to put it in, your, uh, macro, uh, in, in the macro category of your library so you can drag it down and you, uh, reuse it multiple times. So back to NBCR, um, and in, within AB, NBCR we're looking at problems that have become a little uh, more complex than a single uh, docking cal calculation. And we are confronted with these complex work workflows where maybe you're going to take a, a receptor and do some dynamic run and then filter your snapshots to select a bunch of target, uh, target confirmation of the receptor, you have a database of ligands, you filter the, the ligands that you want to use, you do some virtual screening, and then you need to analyze your results. This is true also if you're going to use a microscope to acquire some data, build a model and run some simulations, or, sorry, I'm going backwards, or you, you get some MRI data, you know, segment the, the, your, uh, your, your volumetric data and, and build a, a heart model. These are all, always complex workflows that involve a number of uh, computational tools and in addition to the fact that you need to, uh, you want to be able to build this workflow, you want to, to be able to visualize the workflow, you also want to be able to capture how, the, how did you end up with a certain result and if you can capture the workflow you have, you have a good par part of how you got to this result. So this idea of uh, scientific workflow has been pushing the development of vision into new directions. We have, initially we wrote vision as an interactive tool to extend, you know, to write these little networks where I change a dial and I see something happen in my visualization. Um, these big network, these big, big workflows are going to have execution times that take weeks maybe. So this is a diff somewhat different problem. So we've been looking at a, a number of uh, uh, different aspects where we need to evolve vision in order to, to meet the, the, the needs. And the first one has been uh, to look at uh, the, uh, a way to have distributed repositories of nodes and networks. Uh, very often when you start vi with vision you, s you have a rough idea of what you want to do and you wonder is there a network 
did somebody write a network that does something pretty close that I could use as a starting point? And uh, we have started collaborating with uh, Cla Claudio Silva at the University of Utah. They have a tool called Vistrail, which in, in spirit is very similar to what Vision does. But really what where they have uh, innovated is with the concept of provenance. Provenance is the, is the idea that you understand how this network has been built. And not only do you understand, but like you can go back. You can say, take me back to step number five in the construction of this network. And you keep track of anything you do to this network. Do I add a new node? Do I delete a connection? Do I set a parameter? And so when you get to the end at a certain visualization, you have the whole history of how you got there. And that's very valuable. So we wanted to collaborate with them. This is a Python-based tool as well. So we have a very, we're very compatible. And actually, um, it took them about a week to take vision and write a filter that automatically converts any vision node into nodes that can be used within Vistrail. So they can, we can build a, uh, currently we can build a, a, a network in vision that can be rebuilt uh, in Vistrail. So the bridge is built, it's a one-way bridge currently, but it will be quite easy to, to do the reverse, I believe, and also to start reusing some of the provenance uh, management that they have in the tool. Um, the second point that I'd like to address is uh, multi-process and, and remote execution of networks. So when you use Python, uh, there is a, a little bit of a problem. Um, it's called the global uh, interpreter lock, which is a lock in the Python interpreter that prevents concurrency. Concurrency is when you have two threads and you have two cores, you can run the two threads in parallel on the two cores. Python cannot do that. When you have two threads in Python, because of the global lock, the threads will alternate on one CPU while the other CPU is doing nothing. With the revolution that's going on with, with the CPUs, we definitely want to be able to use multiple cores. So wh what we have, ha have done is look at IPython, which is a, a shell on top of Python, um, in which they have started uh, looking at uh, parallel execution. And basically, what you can do is you can instantiate one, one of these multiple engine controller and specify the number of cores that you want to use. And this basically creates four processes that run the same Python interpreter. And from there, you can start distributing some of your calculations on these cores. So using this mechanism, we should be able to, for instance, parallelize uh, loops, like iteration loops in Vision will be run in parallel on, on the cores. And this is really good. I mean, it's really not very fancy, but if you have you know, in, in a few years, you're going to have 16, maybe 32 core on your desktop. And these core are probably just for your own use. So you can afford to say on demand, I just want to compute that there now. And I don't have to worry about logging in or saying who I am. The other way to get access to, uh, to parallel execution is through the web services. And uh, we have this, this basic support so far for web services where the web services library gives you this load web services node that you can instantiate. And here you're going to type in a URL that takes you to a Opal web service services server. And basically it's going to connect to the web service and find the, the web ser the, the server is capable of telling me what are the services that are running and send me some metadata that describes the service sufficiently that I can generate a vision node on the fly that exposes this web service uh, in this environment. So I can connect to a second, uh, type in a different address, and get a second set of web services. So whenever I use one of these nodes, this calculation will run on this hardware, or whatever cluster is behind this service, and these nodes are going to run on this hardware. Oh, I thought I have. Oh, OK. Um, and so we have started the. Uh, developing more and more web services, in particular for Autodoc virtual screening. And you have uh, nodes that prepare an experiment. They just generate a bunch of uh, file nodes. We can prepare a receptor for an Autodoc calculation, compute the Autodoc grids. And for a given receptor, we can pass uh, a database of ligands and fire up a virtual screen that's going to basically farm out a bunch of uh, uh, docking jobs. and. This is just the top node, right? Um, that contains all these, right? 
So you can build a vision network that basically here takes a directory and is going to read a bunch of receptor out of this directory and do an iteration for every one of these receptor it's going to do a virtual screening for a given uh, database of ligands. So you can start wiring your things together and the way you decide where things run is because you decided to instantiate a virtual screening node that was discovered on the NBCR resource. So this is how you graphically specify where your cal calculations are going to take place. And another reason for, uh, for doing this, like uh, implementing this in this way, is that the virtual screening is actually a macro network in which the preparation of a receptor has a certain number of steps, some of which you might want to bypass. For instance, uh, the preparation of a receptor in, uh, involves protonating the receptor, computing charges, Maybe you already have a receptor that is protonated just the way you want it and the charges are okay. So you can go inside this network and just bypass the, the, the step that's going to do these things for you. So yeah, actually. And um, the other direction we've been looking at is um, vision has been used interactively. So we always assume the graphical user interface would, would always be present. Uh, and that's ob obviously not the case. When you set up one of these virtual screening things, you want to s start your job and say, okay, run it, and I, I want to I reconnect later to see where it's, where it's at. So we added this, what we call de detached execution mode, where when you click on this little arrow here, um, it actually saves this network, and it's going to run this network in a detached process without running the graphical user interface. So here I create a process and execute this network without, uh, graph yeah, without uh, as, just as a detached process. Um, this process has then uh, listens to connections on a socket and uh, any client can connect to this and the graphical user interface is going to connect this as a client and is going to hijack all the widgets here to actually go and communicate with the process and set the value of this parameter in there. So once I have started my, my, the execution of this network in this process, this dial, when I modify it in my graphical user interface, is actually going to go set the value of this parameter in my network. So I can do steering through the graphical user interface for this process. And in fact, uh, this is the Python code it takes for, to write another client that would connect to this process. Basically, you import socket, create a, a socket, and connect on a port that th this process tells you what, what port it's listening to. And then you build Python code that you send to the process to that, and that gets evaluated. This particular code creates a variable called VAL that is the value of this widget here, and then sends it back as a string to the client. So we, then we send the code, it gets evaluated, and then we read back the result and, and print it. So we get bidirectional communication that allows us to disconnect the graphical user interface and tomorrow you come back to work and you can start your network and reconnect to the process and see where am I? Is, has it completed? Did it fail? What is the, what is the status? And uh, I'll finish just with some acknowledgments. Uh, Art Olson, David Guthel, Garrett Morris are the main people behind Autodoc, which has been, which is a big part of what many of you have seen uh, during uh, the Summer Institute. Uh, all these people have contributed to the virtual screening um, track, uh, which uses some of the tools that I've talked about here today. Uh, Guillaume Varey and Jane, Luca and Wilfried, we have worked on the, the workflow track. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>